Mahmoud of Ghazna, born in 967 and died in 1030. After the overthrow of the Umayyads in 750, the Abbasid assumed political leadership of the Muslim world. At the time, the Muslim world extended from Spain in the west to the banks of the Indus in the east. And although prominent Abbasid caliphs like Abu Jafar al-Mansur and Harun al-Rashid consolidated and substantially expanded the Abbasid rule, their successors failed to maintain their grip on power and, as a result, the vast Abbasid empire broke up into a series of regional political entities during the 10th century. One of the most prominent regional powers of the time was the Ghaznavids, inaugurated in 961 by the Alp Tigin, a charismatic Turkish military commander who once served the Samanids of Khurasan and Transoxania. The first independent Ghaznavid principality was formally established in 977 by the Sabuktakin, also spelt as Sabuktagin, a son-in-law of Alp Tigin. By all accounts, Sebuk Tekin was a fearless military commander and a wise political administrator who, during his reign of two decades, not only consolidated Ghaznavid's rule, but also established peace, order and security across his kingdom. Following his death in 997, his young son Ismail ascended the throne, but he proved to be inexperienced and incompetent, and was therefore succeeded by his older brother, Mahmud. It was under Mahmud's stewardship that the Ghaznavids became one of Asia's most prominent political powers, as well as generous patrons of learning and education. Mahmud ibn Sabuktigin al-Ghaznavi was born into a prominent Turkish family of soldiers and military leaders, hailing from the steeps of Central Asia. His ancestors were originally recruited by the Abbasids in order to bolster their military might and power. Bold, fearless and loyal, these fresh recruits were offered military training and rewarded handsomely by the Abbasid elites to maintain the status quo. Their bravery, their courage and their loyalty soon won them the favour of the Abbasid rulers, who promoted them to the highest echelons of the armed forces. Mahmud's ancestors belonged to this privileged group who later came to exercise considerable political and military power within the locality. Although Mahmud's father, Sabuktekin, initially worked for the Samanis' leaders, Alptigin, the two went on to become friends, with Sabuktekin marrying Alptigin's daughter, who bore him his son. This son was Mahmud. Educated by his mother at home, Mahmud committed the entire Quran to memory during his early years. Known to have been a talented student, he swiftly acquired proficiency in Arabic language, literature, poetry and aspects of traditional Islamic sciences. Impressed by his son's intellectual ability and literary interests, his father, who at the time served as governor of Khurasan under Nuh II of Bukhara, that's no the second Bukhara, the, then trained him in the arts of political governance and military strategy. During this period, Mahmud served his father as a deputy and acquired first-hand experience of political and civil administration. After his father's death, he overthrew his younger brother from power and ascended the Ghaznavid throne at the age of around 28. Unlike his father, he was a wise and energetic ruler and soon after becoming Sultan, prepared his armed forces in order to execute his first military expedition. In fact, within the first year of his reign, he overthrew the Samanis and conquered all their territories up to the Oxus, hitherto restricted to the province of Ghazna in eastern Afghanistan, including parts of northeastern Iran. The Ghaznavid dynasty now received an unprecedented political and military boost under Mahmud's able leadership. By inflicting a crushing defeat of the Samanids, he proved his credentials as a military commander and gifted strategist. A year later, he marched into Kohistan and added this territory to his rapidly expanding empire. He then turned his attention towards India and in 1001 launched his first military campaign against a Hindu ruler, Jaipal I of Punjab. The two armies clashed near Peshawar, which is in present-day Pakistan, and after a fierce 
battle, Sultan Mahmud's forces inflicted a crushing defeat on their enemies. Jaipal I was also captured during this battle. Later released on condition that he should not instigate any further attacks against the Ghaznavids and also pay an annual tribute to the Sultan. Jaipal I violated the agreement soon after his release by launching two further attacks against the Sultan's forces. However, on each occasion he suffered a heavy defeat. Distressed and devastated by his defeat, Jaipal I abdicated and committed suicide. The victorious Sultan Mahmud, however, went on to extend his territorial control all the way to the banks of the Indus. Only 30 at the time, he became the ruler of an empire which now extended all the way from Central Asia to the Indus Valley. Only 30 at the time, he became the ruler of an empire which now extended all the way from Central Asia to the Indus Valley and did so from his political base in the eastern Afghan province of Ghazna. Then, in 1002, the Sultan captured the province of Sistan before making preparations to cross the Indus. Two years later, he crossed the river with his large army and swiftly annexed the region, which is today known as Behra. In the following year, he captured Ghur and Multan and ousted the, its ruler, Daud, David in other words, an adherent to the heretical Carmathian creed, from power. As expected, the Sultan's instant and overwhelming success against his enemies caused intense consternation to all the reigning Hindu rulers. Worried that the Sultan was getting too close to their territories for their comfort, the Hindu rulers came together to create a confederation of Hindu principalities in order to confront the advancing Ghaznavid conqueror. The combined might of the Hindu forces clashed with the Sultan's army in 1008, close to modern Hazro. Led by Atnan Bal, the son of the successor of Jaipal I, the Hindu contingent consisted of troops from across India, including Goliar, Galanjar, Dehli and Ajmer. Likewise, Sultan Mahmud's forces were an organised and disciplined fighting force and, as expected, they fought with great skill and determination. In the ensuing battle, the Sultan forces gained the upper hand and forced their adversaries to flee in disorder. This was one of the major military victories of Sultan Mahmud's career and enabled him to further extend Ghaznavid suzerainty. Keen to press home his advantage, he quickly reorganised his forces and marched into Punjab in 1009 in order to teach the treacherous Adnan Pal a lesson for violating his agreements to pay an annual tribute to the Ghaznavids. Over the next decade or so, the Sultan faced stiff opposition and repeated attacks from various Hindu factions, both from land and by sea. But he vanquished his opponents on each and every occasion, and in so doing, he extended Ghaznavid rule into mainland India. After establishing a permanent political a military base in Lahore, which became the capital of the Ghaznavid Punjab. Sultan Mahmud went on to consolidate his rule across the northwest of India, including the province of Sindh. Subsequently, in 1018, the Sultan turned his attention towards the west and swiftly overthrew the Khwarizm Shah of Central Asia. He then launched an expedition against the Wawayids, the Buyids, and in the process captured the historical Persian city of Rai. Indeed, he dominated Central Asia to such an extent that he became the undisputed ruler of that whole region. In the east, the Sultan fought a total of 17 different battles against various Indian rulers and thereby established Ghaznavid supremacy across a large part of India. As a result, he became one of the most powerful and influential Muslim rulers of the 11th century. And although some Hindus and Muslim historians have accused him of being a brutal, bloodthirsty and uncivilised military conqueror, a balanced and impartial assessment of his life and career provides a rather different picture of a man who went on to establish an empire which would dominate Asian history for more than 200 years. The Sultan's Hindu critics misrepresent him because he detested idolatry and repeatedly crushed his Hindu opponents on the battlefield. 
As a practicing Muslim, he considered the Hindu practice of worshipping and adoring idols an abomination. But he did not force the Hindus to renounce their faith or to convert to Islam. As a Hafiz, as one who has committed the entire Quran to memory, he was aware of the explicit Quranic injunctions concerning the freedom to choose and practice one's faith. Thus, far from being anti-Hindu, he went out of his way to employ Hindus within his military and civil services. Indeed, he even promoted them to positions of considerable power and authority. For instance, Dalik Roy and Sonny were two of his most prominent Hindu military generals and served him with great loyalty and great distinction. And furthermore, a third of his army consisted of Hindus, while five out of his twelve senior generals were of Hindu origin. But as a devout Muslim, the Sultan understandably had little sympathy for those who, having pledged loyalty to him, subsequently tried to betray him. For such people he had no mercy or compassion, rather he punished them with an exemplary manner in order to deter others from doing the same. It is also true that in various occasions he attacked and destroyed several Hindu temples, such as Somnath Temple. But to be fair to him, he did this out of political necessity rather than any other consideration. As it so happens, his Hindu opponents regularly stored gold as well as arms and ammunition inside their temples, from which they also attacked his forces so that he had no options but to retaliate and in the process he damaged and destroyed several Hindu temples. But unlike many other influential Asian rulers, the Sultan was not a racist or a religious zealot. On the contrary, he tried to follow Islamic principles and practices to the best of his ability, and did so both in times of war and in times of peace. That does not mean to say that he was totally innocent. No doubt he had his share of faults and made mistakes and he would have been the first person to accept this thanks to his early training in Islamic theological and legal sciences. He genuinely tried to make things easier for his Muslims and non-Muslim subjects alike. And in that sense he was much wiser and tolerant than many other great Asian rulers and conquerors. Indeed Sultan Mahmud was not only a great conqueror he was also one of Asia's most educated and articulate rulers. He transformed Ghazna, the capital of his vast empire, into one of Asia's most prominent centres of learning and culture of the time. As a generous patron of science, literary activities, arts and architecture, he constructed scores of beautiful mosques, colleges, libraries, fountains and reservoirs throughout his empire, especially in Ghazna. Thanks to his love of learning and education, he also recruited some of the Muslim world's most great scholars, thinkers, literary figures to his courts of in Ghazna, including Abu Rehan al-Buruni, the famous scientist and historian, al-Farabi, a great philosopher and logician, Unsuri, a distinguished linguist and grammarian, Abul Qasim Firdosi, the celebrated poet laureate. Under the generous patronage of Sultan Mahmud, these and other great Muslim scholars and thinkers not only pursued their study and research in science, mathematics, philosophy, history, linguistics and comparative religion, but also produced some of the most influential works. As if this was not enough, the poets who lived in his courts regularly competed with each other to compose verses in praise of the Sultan in order to win his favour. Ferdowsi was one such poet and composed his monumental Shahnama, the Book of Kings, during Sultan Mahmud's reign, and dedicated it to him. In appreciation of his efforts, the Sultan sent him a sack containing 60,000 gold coins, but unfortunately Ferdowsi died before the caravan carrying the monies reached his native Tus. Today, the Shanama is widely considered to be one of the greatest epic poems of all time. Keen to maintain Islamic unity and solidarity, Sultan Mahmud also became a friend and ally of the Orthodox Abbas al Khalif in Baghdad. After recognizing Khalif al Qadir as the Khalif of all Muslims, he restored the practice of mentioning the Khalif's name in the Friday prayer sermon, the Khutbah across the Ghaznavid territories and in response the Khalif bestowed the grand title 
or friend of the commander of the faithful and the right hand of the state, the faithful and of the community, on Sultan Mahmud. During his 31-year reign, the Sultan completely rewrote the history of not only Asia, but also the Muslim world as a whole. He died at the age of 63 and was buried in Ghazna, located in present-day Afghanistan.